tonight on Reporting Scotland. Controversy over a payoff package for the former chief executive of the troubled health board, NHS Tayside. Legal proceedings begin to stop the eviction of former asylum seekers housed by Serco in Glasgow. I came to a country where the country is known for democracy and equality. Have I been given that? I don't feel that at all. We speak live to Serco's chief executive, also on the programme. NHS Grampian is forced to close two wards for patients with dementia because of a shortage of nurses. And are you cool enough under pressure to be an air traffic controller? Only one person in 200 gets through the application process. And from birds of a feather to the fringe, Pauline Quirk takes her acting academy to the Edinburgh Festival. Good evening. There are claims tonight NHS Tayside's former chief executive received a payoff package of more than £300,000. Leslie Maclay was removed from her post nearly four months ago following concerns over financial management and it's been confirmed she left the board last week. Tonight NHS Tayside denied the payoff was on that scale. Andrew Anderson reports. Leslie McClay seen here earlier this year with the then Health Secretary. She was forced out of her job in April. Shona Robson called her position as NHS Tayside Chief Executive untenable. Ms McClay went on sick leave and four months later she's now left the organisation. This MSP says she understands Ms McClay has left with a payoff of more than £300,000. Quite frankly, I think this is a slap in the face for everyone working in NHS Tayside and for the people of Tayside. She presided over financial chaos in NHS Tayside and a real lack of leadership of staff um, and for patient care there as well. NHS Tayside has suffered years of financial difficulties. The government's bailed it out on a number of occasions to the tune of £40 million. Already under close scrutiny, it then emerged the board had used charity money to help pay for an IT system. Leslie McClay and the chairman, John Connell, were replaced. This is not the first time a senior NHS executive has left with a payoff in controversial circumstances. It's happened in NHS Lothian and NHS Grampian, but this one seems to have caused particular outrage. Earlier today, the First Minister was asked about the reports of a large payout. So these are contractual matters between uh, NHS Tayside and the member of staff concerned. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on the detail of that. What is important for the government and what I think is important for the board is that the momentum now in making sure that the issues in that health board are addressed continues. Tonight NHS Tayside said it denied the claims but would not confirm how much its former chief executive had been paid. It went on, as with any NHS Tayside employee, Ms McClay received what she was contractually entitled to and nothing more upon leaving the organisation. Scotland's public spending watchdog has already said she would look carefully at any severance money paid to Leslie McClay. We've been unable so far to contact Ms McClay for her comment. Andrew Anderson, reporting Scotland, Dundee. A 31-year-old man has died following a disturbance involving four people in Clyde Bank in Western Bartonshire. Police were called to the scene near Cleddon's Bar yesterday evening. Another man is in a critical condition in hospital. A 45-year-old man and a 38-year-old woman have been arrested. A housing charity has taken legal action to try to stop three asylum seekers from being evicted from their homes in Glasgow. The properties are run by Home Office contractor Serco. Shelter Scotland says the eviction notices are human rights breaches. Katrina Renton has been speaking to one man who faces losing his home. Khalil Fatahi came to Scotland from Iran in 2015. He says he was not safe there and claimed asylum here. His original application was rejected, but he has now made a fresh claim. He was one of the six people who received a seven-day eviction notice last week. He spoke to me through an interpreter. I was at a friend's house where I got a call from my house officer and he came home, he gave him that letter and to sign and of course that letter is to leave the apartment. 
Khalil was a delivery man in Iran. He says all he wants to do is get a job here. And if he loses his home, he doesn't know what he will do. I've been kicked off my own country and this is kicking me out as well. So I would rather die than live on the streets. That is just, that's just no life. Today at Glasgow Sheriff Court, a housing charity was one of two organisations challenging whether the Home Office contractor Circle has the right to do this. We're arguing that Compass and Circle uh, are acting on instructions from the Home Office and are acting as a, as a public authority and therefore have obligations under the, the Human Rights Act um, that there's a requirement for there to be due process that there needs to be safeguards in place and that it's not satisfactory, it's not compliant for there to, to merely be a lock change at a certain stage. At the weekend, Circo eviction notices were symbolically burned outside the immigration offices in Glasgow. The Home Office only pays Circo to house people who are going through the process of seeking asylum. They say they have been funding over 300 people who have exhausted that process. The UK government says it hopes to find a way forward. The UK government approach towards all the visa issues is to ensure that while we have control of our borders, we also temper that control with compassion and understanding. For Khalil, a temporary reprieve of 21 days, as Serco has paused the eviction process ahead of the court case. Katrina Renton, reporting Scotland, Glasgow. Well, Rupert Soames is the chief executive of Serco and is at Westminster this evening. Mr Soames, uh, good evening to you. You have welcomed this legal action. Does that mean that you agree that the, the rules surrounding asylum seekers need some clarification? Well, I think it's obviously going to be very helpful if people have confidence uh, that what we are doing is fully in accordance with the law. And uh, it's an untested area of law. We have advice that it is completely lawful to do. But actually, we are pleased that these actions are going to be uh, taken because it will allow the public to see that um, exactly what the legal position is. You, you stand accused of carrying out the, um, the process of threatening to evict people before they've gone through the entire process. Can you categorically state that that hasn't happened? I can categorically state to you the following. First of all, we are not the judge of this. It's We are housing providers contracted by the Home Office. The Home Office tells us when the taxpayer is no longer going to pay for people to be housed and when, uh, from the Home Office's point of view, the appeals uh, process has been exhausted. At that point, they stop paying uh, any money to us. And at that point, we're put in an impossible position because we have people who are often vulnerable um, uh, and often very concerned, which is why, for the past many years, we've actually been putting up these people at our own expense, some 330 people at the moment, who uh, we are paying for to put up because we don't want to, nobody wants to make anybody homeless. You mentioned the Home Office. We've been trying to speak to someone from the Home Office. We've tried to get an interview with the Immigration Minister. Your company has come in for an awful lot of criticisms surrounding this. Do you feel in any way you've been left to carry the can? No, this is not about our company or me or carrying can. This is about, if there's one useful thing that's going to come out of this, is that people are having to recognise that there is a real problem in this country and a very specific problem in Glasgow. There are about 25,500 people who each year apply for asylum in the uh, UK and about half of them, after a uh, process that may last between one and two years, about half of them will receive negative decisions and half of them will be granted right to remain. And what is happening, though, is that we need to have a grown-up discussion about what happens when uh, people who ha have negative decisions when the answer is we're really sorry but no. And do you uh, believe, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt because time mm. is short, do you believe that your company has been carrying out its business with compassion and understanding as described by Michael Gove in our piece there? 
I think with more than compassion and understanding, we are paying pro bono out of our pocket to put up 330 people, but we can't go on. We've been su supporting people now for two years. Eight, more than 80 people have been with us for more than six months after receiving uh, a negative decision when actually they don't have the right of residency in this country. But we've done it for all the right humanitarian reasons, but we just can't go on. Rupert Soames, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Two wards treating dementia patients have been closed for a year by NHS Grampian because of a shortage of nursing staff. One in five nursing posts at Aberdeen Royal Cornhill Hospital is vacant. Rachel Bell reports. Bringing comfort and joy to these dementia patients in Aberdeen. I keep my grass doing the job. <laughs> In June this year, Wilson and Applejack visited the Lockhead Day Hospital. Several weeks on, this facility is being temporarily closed down, along with the nearby Lauriston Ward. NHS Grampian says staff shortages mean it's simply unsafe to run the services. This is absolutely not about money. This is about an issue with sourcing, so the number of professionals that are coming through the system um, and our ability to attract and retain them within the north of Scotland. This isn't the first time NHS Grampian has been forced to make changes due to staff shortages. Recruitment difficulties have led to the controversial downgrading of maternity and paediatric services at Dr Gray's Hospital in Elgin. Here at Corn Hill, NHS Grampian says it currently has 55 nursing vacancies. That's 22% of its registered nursing staff. Newly qualified nurses will boost the numbers in October, but it's still not enough and these facilities will be closed for the next year. Alternative arrangements are being made for patients affected by the changes. The charity Alzheimer's Scotland says ensuring a safe transition is key. The decisions have been made and I suppose our priority is to recognise the commitment and dedication from the nursing staff and allied health professionals within the specialist units, but also to recognise that we are really keen that the transition and the safe transition of the patients within these environments to other community care settings is met. NHS Grampian says it's working to recruit staff as soon as possible. It says if posts aren't filled, it will be faced with yet more difficult decisions. Rachel Bell, reporting Scotland, Aberdeen. Well, let's go now to our health correspondent, Lisa Summers, who's at St John's Hospital in Livingston. And Lisa, this problem of recruitment and retention of NHS staff is, is a much wider issue. Well, that's right, Jackie. Uh, staffing problems are having an impact at this hospital here at NHS Lothian. They've been struggling to recruit enough children's doctors, and that means they can't run a 24-hour service. So from time to time, children are diverted to the sick kids in Edinburgh. Well, that's 20 miles away. We know in the Highlands there have been problems that's led to the downgrading of some maternity services. And it's affecting cities too. In Glasgow, for example, the shortage of GPs has meant that on occasions it's had to close some of its out-of-hours centres and ask and people instead to go to A&E. So what is being done? Well, the Scottish Government have offered a better pay deal to nursing and other healthcare professionals here in Scotland than has been agreed elsewhere in the UK. They also have increased the number of training places for both nurses and doctors. But many in the profession say that that's not enough to cover the shortfall. And you're not guaranteed to stay here just because you train here. Um, and elsewhere, we have seen uh, wider shortages that are having an impact if you throw into the mix for example uh, the uncertainty over Brexit the fact that there's an aging workforce uh, then it's hard to see any quick fix to all of this and I think as patients we're all starting to feel and to see the impact of these recruitment problems. Lisa thank you. The number of passengers flying to and from Scotland is close to a record high this summer and the air traffic control service says it's taking on more staff to cope with all those extra flights. But it's a demanding job and only one person makes it through the selection process for every 200 who apply. Our transport correspondent David Henderson reports from Aberdeen Airport. OK, cheers. They're watching Scotland's skies. 4611, contact Aberdeen Ground, 121.7. These air traffic controllers manage planes across a vast area, from Shetland right down the east coast and far out into the North Sea. 614, land 16, we get left at Echo 9, traffic further down the runway, surfaces 2. Every year, 100,000 planes and helicopters take off and land here. 
So it's a good place for Elaine Dickens to learn her new career. She's been training for four months. It's really fun so far. <laughs> um, there's an element of pressure, um, but they train us very well. So, yeah, I really enjoy it. I like the challenge. From here, aircraft take engineers out to oil and gas rigs and to offshore wind farms. It makes Aberdeen the busiest heliport in the world, with more air traffic controllers than even its giant rival, Heathrow. Air traffic control has changed a lot in recent years, and that's largely down to modern technology. But at its heart, the job remains the same. It's about solving problems when it really matters. Evo 731 Aberdeen Radar, good morning. Offshore deconfliction service. So the service plans to boost its workforce, to cope with growing demand. This industry's changing fast as passenger numbers keep on rising and our skies get ever more congested. Soon, many planes won't be confined to narrow flight paths. They'll fly point to point, guided by satellite. The operation of being an air traffic controller will change slightly and we hope it will, uh, will reflect a, yes, a more modernised airspace, uh, an airspace that's not restricted as perhaps it is at the moment by a design that was, uh, was made in the 1950s. So as Scotland's airports gear up for their busiest summer on record, the growing workforce behind the scenes get on with their job. Cool, calm and in control. David Henderson, reporting Scotland, Aberdeen. It's a quarter to seven. A reminder of tonight's main story. Controversy over a payoff package for the former chief executive of the troubled health board NHS Tayside. And still to come, farmers raise concerns over a sharp rise in sheep being attacked by dogs. A war of words has broken out over how much is being spent on our schools. Labour claims spending by councils has fallen by £400 million since 2010. The Scottish Government says that's only part of the story because there has been a reduction in the number of secondary pupils. Our education correspondent Jamie McIver reports. Education is both a Scottish Government priority and a local council service. Councils decide just how much to spend on schools. Their budgets have been under pressure for years and Labour says this has meant cuts in the classroom. So this is not a new thing. What we're showing is that if we compare uh, spending today in our schools with spending in 2010, we are now spending less in our schools in real terms, £400 million less than we did in 2010. If education is a priority, that simply can't be right. Labour argues the amount spent by councils on education fell from £5.3 billion eight years ago to £4.9 billion last year. Spending on preschool education and primary schools did go up, but this was balanced out, not least by a drop in spending on secondary schools. The Scottish Government argues the fall in secondary spending was closely related to a drop in pupil numbers. A point made by John Swinney as he visited a helpline ahead of tomorrow's exam results. The position on secondary school expenditure is influenced, of course, by the austerity imposed on Scotland by the Tory government in London, but also by the changes, the reductions in secondary pupil numbers. But what I think is very encouraging is the fact that we've seen over the last two years increases, real terms increases in education expenditure by local authorities, and that pattern continuing. Many councils would argue they've been trying their best to protect education from cuts, even when this has meant hard decisions on other local services. And despite headline spending cuts, more students are getting five hires. This year's exam results will no doubt also be scrutinised to see whether policies are getting results too. Jamie McIver, reporting Scotland. The description sheep worrying seems mild for something that can include livestock being attacked and often killed by dogs. According to figures from a leading agricultural insurer, the number of incidents has risen by almost 70% in the last two years. Our environment correspondent Kevin Keane reports. Martin Kennedy is a sheep farmer in Highland, Perthshire, whose flock has been attacked five times in as many years. Well, when I came out in the morning, there was a, there was a sheep just mauled in, in fr right in front of the house here uh, in, in, in the field, and, and it's, it's quite distressing. The sheep was lying dead and in a serious state. There was no immediate sign of the dog, but eventually it was tracked down. 
with somebody that lived in the neighbouring estate, there was a, a dog that looked as if it had been distressed and had crossed a barn and it was wet and had wool in its, its, uh, in its mouth. And uh, so that's what le led us to the conclusion it was that dog. So then the, the owner eventually admitted and the dog was put down. Martin's tail's becoming more common and as vice president of NFU Scotland, he's growing increasingly concerned about the impact it's having on farmers. One case in particular, we lost seven sheep and there's another 16, 17 had to be treated by the vet. Some of them sur sur surgically reconstructed. Um, so it's the, f it's the financial impact can run into thousands of pounds, but it's a psychological impact as well. The rise is put down to the increasing popularity of the countryside for recreational walkers. Mountaineering groups say it's important dog owners are mindful and not just because of livestock. I mean, it is good to let a dog run free. The dog loves it. It's great for you too, but you really have to be aware of what's around you. What, what looks like open moorland, there could be ground nesting birds there which could be disturbed or even killed uh, by a dog running free. While livestock worrying is on the rise, rural crime in general, including theft of farm equipment, has fallen by 3.8%. That's bucking the UK trend, where there's been an average increase of 13.4%. There is a move to legislate to make the law tougher, but farmers hope walkers will simply take heed and keep their dogs on a lead. Kevin Keane reporting Scotland, Perthshire. Rail campaigners say the Scottish Government has failed to deliver on a promise made a decade ago to cut train journey times from Inverness to the Central Belt. They claim that slow journey times and unreliably also have a knock-on effect on the Far North Line to Kyle of Lookout and to Elgin. The Scottish Government insists it's made significant investment in the country's railways. Now, she's best known as Sharon from the sitcom Birds of a Feather. But to hundreds of drama students, Pauline Quirk is the founder of more than 170 acting academies throughout the country, including in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Well, this year, she's also got her own venue at the Edinburgh Fringe. Our arts correspondent, Pauline McLean, can tell us more. When I'm alone with only dreams of Pauline Quirk has been an actress since the age of nine, probably still best known for the TV sitcom Birds of a Feather. Today she's semi-retired and prefers to see other young people in the spotlight. You're getting charged with attempted murder wee man. This is her first fringe venue, showcasing work, much of it from the drama academies set up in her name over the last 10 years. My mum brought us up on her own and, and what have you. We lived in Islington and it was like the 60s and it weren't posh like it is now. Um, people like me didn't become actors. They just didn't. It never happened. So, so we just wanted the children that maybe are for whatever reason, you know, the ones that don't put their hands up to join in or feel they're never going to be able to stand in front of a crowd of people. I'm still there are now 170 Pauline Quirk Academies across the UK, including Glasgow and Edinburgh, which both have shows at the festival. Confidence goes through Confidence, the yeah. When I first started, I was like, I couldn't do anything. I was so nervous to speak at anything. And last year I was at, in, Nove in November, I was in um, London, London and I had a solo part. So the confidence just went through the roof. About Tracy, and I want to be Sharon. There's even a show about birds of a feather and how the writers and actors got their big break. And that's what Pauline Quirk hopes this new venue will offer. It's huge. I can't actually explain... Oh, shut up, Pauline. I can't explain what a huge event this is for us. You know, one, as a parent, I see my boy on stage, but to see children that wouldn't get the chance... <laughs> And they're already looking to make this a regular fringe venue and hope to bring even more young people to the festival in years to come. Polly McLean, reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Well, to the European Championships now, and it's been a big day in the pool for some of Scotland's top swimmers. Anticipation was high for Ross Murdoch and Mark Sharonek, who've been in the pool in the last few minutes. Rona McLeod has been watching the action. A nostalgic entrance for Ross Murdoch. 
It was here at Toll Cross that he won gold in the 200 metres breaststroke at the 2014 Commonwealth Games. Tonight, as defending European champion in the same event, he hoped to repeat the feat. It was always going to be a tough task. The Scot qualified third fastest behind the Russian Anton Chupkov and the Italian Luca Pizzini. There's no doubt about the win. I think that's going to be Anton Chupkov of Russia. What a brilliant swim from In the end, it was desperately close. Fourth place for Murdoch, just one hundredth of a second outside the medals. I mean, it's tough to miss out by a hundred, you know, that's what it is, it's the hundred of a second there. Um, yeah, obviously I'm pretty disappointed, you know, I felt really, really good last night. I felt it was like because I was on, a, you know, best time form, but to no avail tonight, unfortunately for me. Then time for another Scot hoping to medal. Mark Sharanik won silver for Team Scotland in the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in the 400 metres individual medley. Tonight he was out to impress in the shorter 200 metres IM event, but he also finished out of the medals in fifth place. And there's the potential for more medals for Scots tonight in the velodrome. Jack Carlin is in the bronze medal final of the men's sprint at 7.20. And for Katie Archibald, the Omnium reaches its conclusion just after 8 o'clock. Rona McLeod, reporting Scotland. Well, let's take a look at what the weather has in store now from Christopher. Jackie, thank you. Hello there, good evening to you. Well, a real mix of conditions today. Some sunshine for some and in the northeast in that sunshine, 25 degrees elsewhere. Fairly unsettled, and the week ahead is somewhat unsettled. This is the jet stream dipping quite far south to the north of it, low pressure systems. That means breezy at times, some rain, some showers, but some sunshine too, and quite a fresh feel. So over the next few hours, fairly cloudy, still some showery outbreaks of rain across the southern uplands and a few showers developing uh, through the highlands and islands. Elsewhere, reasonably dry. Temperatures around about 11 to 14 Celsius, but uh, through the central highlands, rural areas, it will be cooler than that, similar to across Grampian. So to start Tuesday, some showery rain across parts of the borders through the Lothians and just brushing the east coast for a time and a number of showers in the northwest. Elsewhere, largely dry but fairly cloudy. And by mid-afternoon, there'll be some brightness coming through at times and temperatures around about 18 to 19 Celsius at most. So bear in mind, some areas today within the mid-20s are going to feel a good bit cooler for you tomorrow. Elsewhere, somewhat similar temperature to today really and some showery outbreaks of rain through the highlands and islands the best of any brightness around the murray firth and to the north and east of any high ground but quite a fresh wind around northwestern coasts the rest of the afternoon into the evening and overnight little in the way of change and little in the way of change midweek with that low pressure fairly stubborn an unwelcome guest not moving that means it's going to be well a case of some sunshine some showers uh, but despite any bright spells still quite a cool if not fresh feel so here's Wednesday's chart, and it's a reasonably dry start, but showers get going coming in from the west. Some brightness around, the best of that to be found towards uh, eastern Scotland, and later on across the Hebrides, temperatures around about the mid to high teens. And then for Thursday, we just ramp those showers up somewhat. They will be heavy at times, the odd rumble of thunder in the mix, and as I say, temperatures around about the mid-teens for most driest in the east. That's the forecast for now. Back to summer as we know it, Christopher, thank you. That's Reporting Scotland. Join me at half past ten, if you can. From all the team, goodbye. No.